you got to become self-aware. And as you become self-aware, you realize where you rub people the wrong way, what things you might react to instead of respond to. And then you take note of all that. And soon you have a mental checklist of your own owner's manual. And then you show up as a human being and not a human animal that reacts. Welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast. Hey, friends. Welcome back to another Amazing episode of the Fitness CEO. My man B back in the studio. We're back. Another mm-hmm. month. Here we go. So today's topic is self mastery. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fair to say if you can't successfully lead yourself, how can you lead your family, organization, your community? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what self mastery is, yep. some strategies, how to be a better version, and really what that means. So B, why don't you unpack this box from your perspective? I got some follow up questions. Yeah. Something like well, that. as uh, now that I'm almost a half a century old. In fact, I just turned 49 years old. Um, I realize in this near half a century that I've lived, our entire purpose on this planet is to achieve self-mastery. And I say that because you can go buy a washer and dryer or a microwave. It'll come with some kind of an owner's manual. You buy a car, it comes with a thick owner's manual. Um, When you were born, there is no owner's manual given to your parents and certainly not handed off to you as you become an adult. Mm -hmm. And so we realize, like, gosh, how does this mechanism operate? We've got a brain, we've got a heart, our brain thinks, our heart feels, and somewhere in between the brain and the heart, there's the mind. What is the mind? What organ is the mind? The mind is a construct, right? Like, in this room, I could feel that it's scary. You might feel it's safe. My mind can tell me that it's scary in here, you might feel that it's safe. Mm -hmm. And how I feel is determined on my past experiences. My past experiences can be solved if those experiences were trauma, say physical abuse, emotional abuse, mental abuse. In my case, I was sexually abused as a young man, right? Uh, I've talked about this plenty of times. And whatever the form of abuse showed up or whatever the life experience you've had, Maybe you come from a poor family, a rich family, a family where there's been maybe some bigotry or racism shown. That ends up putting filters on you and your experience, how you experience life is different. And so you must achieve self-mastery. Effectively, you must start rewriting or writing for the first time the owner's manual of self. And that is why I think self-mastery really is taking us from a state of being a human animal, which is impulsive, selfish, greedy, emotional, operating off of feelings, and elevating to human being, consciousness. Um, Some might say the soul, the spirit, where you're operating from a place of glee, a place of joy, a place of abundance, a place of servitude instead of selfish. Uh, But we don't naturally show up as a servant leader, we show up as a selfish consumer, mm-hmm. and it is self mastery that takes us there. Oh, dude, so powerful! Um, when I when you just talk about like self being selfish versus servanthood, I think you know my story with alcohol mm-hmm. and story of addiction, right? And before, I don't want to say um, conquering that because it's a daily ritual, right? right. You know, rent uh, success is rented; it's never due. Rent is due every single day. But uh, in my addiction, when I was addicted to alcohol and drinking, like it was a very selfish, you know, focus. I wasn't thinking about who I could help, who I could serve, who I could show up for. I was thinking about, hey, this guy right here, and how am I going to get my fix, or how am I going to feel better? Um, so I think that's a really, really good uh, something that struck with me. Yeah, yeah, and and it really is is re- is writing your owner's manual for the first time, understanding your body. Why do I think this way? Where does it come from? And some things, by the way, might be factory installed, right? Um, I, I jokingly say to people from stage that every morning I wake up angry and bitter. Mm -hmm. And while I jokingly say that, there's a little tongue in cheek there. Dude, I truly do wake up angry and bitter in the mornings. And I do believe that's factory installed. Some people are just naturally happy and bubbly and whatever in the mornings. That ain't me. So I have a ritual, but I had to figure myself out to realize, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a naturally happy an optimistic person. So I have a ritual that makes me happy and op- optimistic before I leave my bedroom. I listen to a whole playlist by Jack Johnson because when I wake up, 
first thing I do is I turn on my Jack Johnson playlist because how can you not be happy listening to Jack Johnson serenading you? So happy, man. right? And then and then I drink my thirty ounces of water and I hydrate myself and then I sit at the edge of my bed and I send out three gratitude text messages to to because I don't normally wake up in a state of gratitude. I know I should, and it'd be very like self righteous of me to say I wake up every morning in a state of self gratitude. I don't. I wake up angry and bitter. Mm -hmm. And so I have to send out three gratitude messages to three random people in my life that I'm grateful for. You've been the recipient of that many a times. And all those things collectively put me in a better state of mind. Because I realize, oh yeah, there are three things right now, even though I'm a little angry and salty, that I'm really happy for. This person and what they did for me and that person and how they showed up for me when I needed them and that person, how they made that introduction for me. Wow, thank you. And then what ends up happening is I'm able to alter my mood. People don't realize they have absolute control over themselves. That is self-mastery. That is, that is growth. That is personal development, however you want to define it. But it starts with understanding that the owner's manual doesn't exist, and it's up to you to first go, what is this thing that it's thinking, that it's feeling, that it's transferring feelings on others? Or like, oh, Bryce, you know, you're wearing short sleeves. It might be cold in here. You should bundle up. Well, maybe you're run hot. But because I am naturally cold all the time, I might transfer that feeling mm -hmm. on you. And you might be like, why is B being so pushy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, little did I know, like I'm not even self-aware that I'm constantly pushing my own values on other people. So you got to become self-aware. And as you become self-aware, you realize where you rub people the wrong way, what things you might react to instead of respond to. And then you take note of all that. And soon you have a mental checklist of your own owner's manual, and then you show up as a human being and not a human animal that reacts. Let me ask you this. When did you come, speaking of awareness, when did you come to a point where you're like, holy shit, like, I am not where I need to be. Mm. I need to level up, and I need to be a better version of myself. I'm curious if you had an epiphany. Yeah, yeah. So the epiphany was this old Jewish uh, psychotherapist named Dr. Laura Schlesinger, who was on KFI AM talk radio broadcasted out of LA, LA, California. And so when we go back to my late teens, early twenties, when I would do unsavory things, I got involved with some unsavory characters in, in the section eight housing areas that I grew up in. And, uh, somehow I got involved in carjackings and robbing homes and uh, I even talk about how there was that police helicopter chase that I was mm -hmm. in, which I'm not proud of at all, any of these things. And in fact, there was some level of guilt. I believe, unless someone is a complete sociopath, which there are, those Ted Bundys and those Richard Ramirez's, but someone, anyone who's doing just goofy theft and robberies and jack carjackings, whatever, there's some level of guilt. Like you feel a little twinge of something in the back of your, your brain, right? Telling you like, this isn't right. I don't know what got me to listening to AM talk radio, but after I would drop off my friends, of, uh, we'd commit a crime and take whatever it is that we stole to the pawn shop and get money for it, split up the money. Then I would drop off my friends because I was always the getaway driver. Driving home, I would listen to KFI 640, and if Dr. Laura was on, you know, she would talk about one thing I remember specifically is that you know, our job as humans is to show up as servants. If not, then we will always be selfish. And I was mm -hmm. like, ooh, ooh, I didn't serve anybody today. I just was selfishly taking and then extracting value, never giving value mm -hmm. to humanity. Another thing I remember her talking about, because I would blame a lot of my anger on, I love my dad. He brought us to the United States. We escaped communism, but then he never played ball with me. He never encouraged me to play sports. He never really interacted with me, and therefore I kind of grew up like a feral kid in the Section 8 housing. And, and so, of course, I'm going to be a little salty and uh, be a little rough around the edges. Uh, and then Dr. Loro said, you know, if you had a bad father-child relationship, you will have a second chance at that when you become the father and you have a child. I was like, oh crap, I could kind of rewrite my father-child experience. And so I, would, I started becoming a little self-aware because the guilt was just enough that I would listen to Dr. Laura privately, secretly, because all my friends would have laughed at me, like, why are you listening to this talk radio station therapist? Totally. After but, uh, you were doing the crazy yeah, stuff you were doing. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? And soon, each time I would do those things, the feeling of guilt and shame were higher, mm -hmm. right? Because now you know, awareness is the worst thing ever for someone. Like if you want, I, I believe true hell is being aware of your shortcomings 
and doing nothing about it. Mm. That's how you get anxiety. That's how you get depression. That is your subconscious mind knocking on your door in the form of anxiety and depression and saying, dude, you're doing something not congruent to the person you, you want to be. And so I'm going to hit you with anxiety. I'm going to hit you with depression, shame, and guilt. And if you look at, if, you, if everyone watching or listening to this, if they Google the human vibrational frequency chart, just Google that, you'll find a pyramid with rainbow colors on it. And you'll see that guilt and shame have the lowest frequency, vibrational frequency. Way up in the middle is acceptance. If you accept the fact you're doing something stupid mm -hmm. or incongruent, and decide that I'm going to make myself better, your vibrational frequency improves already. And the way at the tippy top of that pyramid is joy, bliss, fulfillment. In other words, you do enough self-mastery, you serve enough of humanity, you show up as a true servant and not a selfish animal, you will achieve the highest levels of joy, bliss, fulfillment. And so I realized that the moment I knew I was doing things that were incongruent to the man I wanted to be, because then I would start thinking about, man, I can't wait to rewrite my father-child story. When I become a father, then I would think, like, how would I feel if my child was doing what I'm doing now? How would I mentor my son so that he doesn't do what I do? So knowing that, why am I still doing it? So you see how guilt, that was my first twinges of anxiety. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so self-awareness really started to wake up with me with listening to the Dr. Loris show. And then as I became self-aware enough to realize like there's a better way I can live my life and I'm not living that life, the gap between how I know I should live and how I was living is where shame, guilt, anxiety, and depression lived. True. And then when you collapse that, you have a better life. And it's so true. And for me, when I think of like the shame, guilt, and anxiety, I think of like work output and we're cut from the same cloth, man. Freaking winners, competitors, like, you know, we, we have a desired outcome in mind. Yeah. And the vast majority of times we get this. But I think I've shared this before. I'm actually okay with not winning, if you can believe this. As long as I know I did every single thing possible, I, there was no stone that was unturned. And if I can, you know, execute something like this and it, the, the ball just doesn't bounce my way, I'm okay with it. But the opposite is, mm. is, is also true. Even if I win, actually, but especially if I don't, and I take a moral inventory and realize there were some corners cut. There were some things I could have done. I could have put in one more rep. I could have stayed there one more night. I could have done a little bit more to push that forward. The anxiety the depression just freaking eats at me. And I think that's, you know, along the same, that, that's same exactly ethos. It. Yeah. And, and that's how conscience shows up, right? Because your conscience knows better. Like, you know, people talk about it. It's like, oh, you know, when you did that thing and then you didn't clean up that mess, you know, did your conscience make you feel guilty? It's your conscience. It's mm -hmm. your better self. Your higher right. self already exists. People think, like, I have to develop my higher self. No, no, no. You just have to connect to it. It's within you, your higher self. It's there talking to you. Yeah. You just have the awareness and just start yeah. listening up. And, and, and if you are a person of faith and religion, and we say that Jesus lives in your heart, Jesus is consciousness because he's known to be perfect. So your perfect self is within. And if you believe in Jesus, you believe in Christianity, mm -hmm. and you know that you were made in his image, your perfect self exists. It's just what we do is we begin to stifle that with greed. And again, I'm, I'm not the most religious of all people. I certainly don't subscribe to any one religion. I believe in universal consciousness and karmic justice. But if we were to just follow that track of Christianity and Jesus, since I think it's something all people can understand, whether mm -hmm. you believe it or not, well, if he lives within us, the most perfect version of him, of you, lives within you, but he's also given you free will, and free will means eh, you could cut corners, not make your bed, hit the snooze button, drink too much alcohol and eat too much sugary foods and really not work out and take care of your body and, well, just barely get by and stay in debt and, and argue more and emotionally react and say things that you regret. Well, that's all free will. But the perfect version exists and it shows up as conscience. Your conscience will gnaw away at you, especially once you know, like, I'm being an asshole right mm -hmm. now, or alcohol is bad for mm -hmm. me. Now when you're sober driving around, you're like, I should do something about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to do something about it. I'll just turn on the music. I'll distract myself. Yep. You can crank that music up as loud as you want. Anxiety, depression, shame, and regret will follow. Still in your ear. Yep. Hey there.
here. My name is Bryce Henson, CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp, and you might know me as the host of this podcast, but what you might not know is that I started my fitness business journey as a Fit Body location owner. And since 2012, I've been able to impact my community while creating financial freedom, both for myself and my family too. You see, by using Fit Body's proven business model, we give you all the support and guidance you need to be your own boss and build a business that aligns with your passion for fitness. And being we are the absolute best at launching and scaling our franchise partners gyms we are now excited to announce our 100 member guarantee now you might be thinking Bryce what is that well we are so confident that we'll launch your fit body boot camp location with well over a hundred paying members from day one on your grand opening that if we don't we'll run your marketing till we do that's how confident we are in our ability to support you and guide you through this process so if you're interested in creating more income through impact click the link somewhere around this video to apply all right, B, so now we've, you know, understand and kind of explain to our audience the value of awareness, the fact that you need to realize at some point you need to be a better human. You need mm -hmm. to evolve. Let's talk about some that strategies. That is literally life's purpose. Like, I just want to stress that. Your life's purpose is, is to become a better human. That's the only way you raise better kids, by the way, by role modeling to your kids. Like, no, no, I'm supposed to be a good parent. No, no. no. You want to be a good parent? Be a better human. You will role model what a good human is versus telling your kids what a good human is. Because as you shared with me, lessons are caught. They are not taught. Correct. So now we have this understanding that we need to be in a constant pursuit of being our best version of, our, of ourselves. But how do we get there how, from strategy? So um, I want to unpack your mindset around this. And before I do, I want to share a little story for me and B. I mean, Kindred Spirits, when I met you over 10 or 11 years ago, one of the things you started talking about was these six-week challenges. And uh, for you new, new to the audience, um, in 2010 to 2012, I decided to move to a little island in the very south of Brazil called Florianopolis to learn another language. And, you know, I usually tell the story, which is very much true. I was a huge Kobe Bryant fan, and Kobe Bryant spoke fluent Italian. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, but I also intrinsically knew that I wanted to test my mettle. Like, I wanted to, like, challenge myself. Because it's all fun and games. You can, you know, take a language class here. Um, but if you can drop yourself off to a foreign continent, to a foreign country, to a foreign land that speaks a foreign language, and then have to develop yourself to get to a point of overcoming that adversity, I knew inherently that was a path that I wanted to develop myself and becoming better. And, you know, over a period of two years and many, you know, challenges and obstacles and feeling frustrated as hell. I can't even order a glass of water, but going through that process and granted, I'm still in the process. I still have my language class once a week. This has been going on for 13 years. I'm happy to, to report that I'm conversationally fluent in the language, but all this to say is like in, inherently I knew, yes, I wanted to learn the language, but way more than that, I wanted to prove myself what I thought was so unimaginable that once I did it, it would just infuse me with a level of confidence and vigor and fulfillment that was after. So yeah. that was one of my stories of overcoming challenges. And then at some point, I saw you giving a keynote, and you were talking about these six-week challenges you did. And I was like, holy shit, man. This guy has not only manifested, but can clearly articulate what he's done. Uh, so I wanted to, to tee you up yeah. and uh, give us some insight. Well, so, so that beautiful example that you just cited was not only did you learn the language, but you wanted to test yourself. Your words, right? You want to test your metal, you said. That was the foundational yeah. reason why. I wanted to test myself, see if like what I learned, if I could apply, use, and get by in this foreign continent that speaks this language, yep. which is why you ended up in Flor Florinopolis. Every person, male or female, has the desire to learn new things, to experience new things, to challenge themselves and then to develop new skills, and then, lo and behold, to test themselves. In fact, a great book written by John Eldridge, Wild at Heart, he talks about, he says, and, and that book is written for men, he says, every man is looking for a battle to fight, an adventure to have, and a beauty to love, right? And so in the book, he goes on to say that every young man is looking to his dad to learn skills and traits of a man, that it's inherent to a man. But then that young man wants to test himself to see if he has what it takes. And the example is that when Andrew, my son, who's now 17, Ooh. he was a little puppy, you know, as a dad, I, 
actually, I taught him and Chloe how to throw punches and stuff. It was just fun to wrestle with them, to roughhouse with them. So I would teach him the punches, and then we would get on our bed and wrestle. He wanted to then test those skills against me to see if he really has what it takes. Today at 17, we are still boxing every other night. Well, not since I tore my tricep, boxing him ironically, <laughs> right? Uh, but we're still boxing after our workouts, you know, just sparring. Because not only do you want to test to see if you have what it takes, but every human still wants to see if do I still have what it takes. And this is for men and women, because you learn the language, you have it. Like someone just learned to ride a bike. I remember my dad, he's 89 now, but probably in his mid-70s, we went, took my dad on a vacation, my mom and dad on a vacation somewhere, and it was like this beautiful Airbnb in Palm Springs, and they had a couple of bikes, like beach cruisers. And he's looking at the bike. I'm like, you want to ride it, don't you? He's like, yeah. He goes, last time I rode a bike was in Armenia, like when he was a little boy. Oh, snap. And he just wanted to know if, 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 he, if he could still do it. No. He's in his late 70s. I'm like, Dad, I think it's a bad idea. But I also know every man needs to test himself to see if he still has what oh, it yeah. takes. Oh, yeah. So I was all right. So I got a hold of his seat, you know, and, which is funny because I got the father and son relationship with my own father. It was a very different experience guiding him along down the street, running after him, and, and he was able to bike that thing. And Life comes full circle, Full man. circle, That's man. Wild. Yeah, he, he, you know, as you get older, you get more childlike, right? And just to see how happy he was and how he lit up, and he was very proud of himself. I still have what it takes, you know? And, and we need that, like, like men or women, to live in your bubble to feel safe. Because there is this thing about, you know, our reptilian mind does want to stay in a very safe environment. We, we want easy mm -hmm. we want comfortable mm -hmm. we want predictable we want convenience for all the reasons the caveman was afraid to walk out of that cave with his him and his cave wife because the saber-toothed tiger or the brontosaurus might eat us yet i have to somehow find a way around those two shifty animals to go and pick that apple or to get some water from the river and make it back to my cave and so while it's convenient and safe in my cave there are things outside of my cave that I want and need to survive. And so, and some of it is a challenge. Can I get past? I'm not even hungry right now. I'm not even thirsty. But can I get past that saber-toothed tiger? And plenty of cavemen have probably died, just like Evil Knievel nowadays, oh, yeah. or all those risk takers who do all the X Games. Can I really take this motorcycle and jump across the Grand Canyon? I mean, I don't know. Do you really want to do that? But we have this inherent desire to test ourselves, to challenge ourselves. So I realized that to develop your higher self, self-mastery is a byproduct of constantly leaning into the walls of your comfort zone and expanding your comfort zone into the zone of discomfort until you stay there long enough where it becomes comfortable. And then you lean again and... Stay there long enough until it becomes comfortable, and then you keep doing rinse and repeat until you die. So when I realized that, the one thing I was afraid of doing was running long distance. In fact, I think the longest I'd run up to that point was maybe like a quarter of a mile. I, in fact, I've always told myself, and what, what a weird human concept this is. We put ourselves in a box. You know, God's made me big and strong. I got thick bones. I've got dense muscles. God's designed me to lift weights, is what I told myself. So I would lift weights, and you know, I was six foot and 240 pounds of muscle, and well, I didn't have to run, because God's made me with this gift, right? But the human body is very adaptable. Oh, yeah. And so when, when I realized that there's a challenge that I do want to take, and truth be told, my wife, who at the time was my girlfriend, inspired me to do this challenge, to run. I was like, hey, I want to sign up for your next marathon. She used to do marathons. I go, when's your next marathon? She said, six weeks from now, which is why it became a six-week challenge. Just by happenstance, it was six weeks ahead of you, yeah. and that's you coined that time yeah. frame. I said, well, sign me up. She goes, hey, knucklehead, you, uh, <laughs> you've never run. You've never run. You, you've maybe like run <laughs> across the parking lot from the gym to get to your car to get your weight belt and back to the gym. Like, so we're going to fire up 26.2 right. miles in six weeks. Right. Let's go, homeboy. Right. And let's not forget that the word marathon <laughs> – is where the messenger back in the Greek days ran to the city of Marathon and died. Died. Happened to be 26.2 miles, right? So yep. like this dude who was a professional messenger, <laughs> a professional runner, died at 26.2 miles on his way to the city of Marathon. <laughs> hence, we named it the Marathon. So she goes, hey, look, it's in six weeks. Do you really want to do it? I said, yes. She goes, there's a half marathon, 13.1 miles. I go, I want to do the full marathon. I want to challenge myself. So I hired a running coach, and in six weeks, 
I became a decent runner, enough where I was able to finish that marathon in just over four hours. Nothing, nothing remarkable to, to write home about. My only goal was to finish the marathon before they start closing it down. Because if you go past, I think, four hours and 45 minutes, or maybe it's five hours, you don't end up doing the full 26.2 because at some point they have to open up that city, mm -hmm. whether it's New York. In my case, it was the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon. Some point because the marathon is at 6 a.m. They got to cut it. Like, yeah, life has to go on. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point, some people end up doing like 19 or 20 miles, never finishing the 26.2. And I didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to finish a full marathon. And so I trained my nuts off for six weeks. Um, did everything my running coach told me to. And wouldn't you know, my body adapted in six weeks. While I was very uncomfortable. I ran that marathon in the process of running and finishing, completing that marathon at the end of six weeks, I realized what other things have I limited myself on? And from there, it, it became this like quest for things that I felt that I'm not good at. I'm not, it's not factory installed for me. Guitar lessons, surfing, rock climbing, salsa dancing, jujitsu, uh, jiu uh, uh, improv, no shit. improv, right? And I realized each one of those things made my life better whether it was surfing or improv or jujitsu, made my life better as an entrepreneur, as a father, as a friend, as a business partner, as a husband, because everything is connected and you realize you have so much more capacity, you have so much more resilience, you are so much more resourceful than you think. All of that is self-mastery. Every challenge that I did, and when I checked it off, I realized, holy cow, you meet your other self on the, uh, on the on the other side of your challenge, whatever that challenge is, whether it's mastering a language and then being dropped off into that continent or a six-week challenge, on the other side of that challenge, you meet your other self, the better self, the higher self. And when you meet that self, you're like, oh, shoot, that was in here all along. What else can I do to really get this person out? Like a muscle, though, your higher self, you don't just meet once and then he hangs around or she hangs around. Like a muscle, it atrophies. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep... Like, if you stopped speaking Portuguese... Within six months, okay, I'd be rusty. Within 12 months, within 18 months, within, like, five years, yeah. it w I, I would lose a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. I now speak half Armenian, half English to my older brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Even though I was born in Armenia yep. and came here and was fluent in Armenian and had to learn English, I have forgotten the Armenian language because I stopped using it. So it is a... So self-mastery is a very perishable trait. We can go back to being human animal very quickly. And so we have to constantly sharpen that iron through, through challenges and pushing through our limits. And the last you know, kind of talking point that I had in terms of giving our audience other strategies, which is challenges and push yourself and surround yourself with like-minded people and listen to awesome podcasts like this. Also going to live events because live yes. events change lives. And there might be an event Next month, which I'm so freaking there fired up about, that's based around self-mastery. It could be called BK Live. That's right. I'm going to tee you up. Uh, <laughs> give me some insight. Give our in uh, audience some insight. They are dying to know. Well, I got to tell you, being, being that you're one of the keynote speakers, I am. right? Yeah. I am. And, and I know you're going to rock the house. Yeah. September 8th and 9th in beautiful Costa Mesa, California, Bedros Cooling Live, BK Live. I'm holding a two-day live event, and you're one of the keynote speakers. We're bringing Navy SEALs because we want to teach the mindset and the resiliency and the unsure shakeable confidence that a Navy SEAL has. Like, how do they think and operate? Seven-figure and multiple eight-figure, nine-figure entrepreneurs. How do they think and process through problems and scale businesses, multiple businesses, to the point where they can scale and sell? Pro athletes, seven-time Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath, right? Uh, wh what does a seven-time Mr. Olympia do to win and win and win and constantly break through limiting beliefs. Uh, the, the most productive and disciplined man on the planet, Craig Ballantyne, is going to be there. Look at that. Sharing his productivity strategies where he can get more done in four hours than most people do in 15, 16, 17 hours. And so I've really brought the best of the best. You're going to be there talking about leadership, entrepreneurship. And really, Bedros Calling Live is for anybody who wants to achieve self-mastery. Uh, I, I say money, meaning, and self-mastery, those, those things. Because money is a vehicle to freedom. It's a vehicle to great experiences. It's a vehicle to serve humanity with, right? I always say make a lot of money, be very generous with it, be good to others with it. 
meaning as in purpose. Like if we don't have a sense of purpose, meaning, significance, we're just kind of drifting through life. And then self-mastery. Who are you really? What is the impact you're going to leave? What is the legacy you're going to have? Did you figure yourself out? Did you tame the human animal and become a human being? And if so, what a great, righteous life you've lived. And so that is everything we're going to teach, coach, and mentor. And as you said, proximity is power. So when you're around like-minded people for two days, learning, connecting, networking, having a great time, you realize like, holy cow, I can time collapse my personal development in money, mindset, meaning, self-mastery, and become a better human being. And then, of course, the next thing I always tell people is now go infect others with that. And so I hope everybody will join us. And your just vibrancy, your frequency raises through the man. roof, man. And uh, let's face it, that's what attracts wealth. That's what attracts yeah. success. Yeah, you've, you've, you're never going to find someone who's, you know, out of shape, low tone, low energy, low vibration, kind of mopey and pessimistic, living the ideal life that you want. No, you're not going to find that person. No. No. In fact, you're going to be repelled by that person. Yeah, totally. And so this event is for people who realize they're meant for more. There's something greater for them out there. People around them are probably not the risk takers that these people are. Like, if you want to find the fighter jets that you belong with. Your tribe, start, baby. Your tribe. And start leaving the crop dusters that you've been hanging out with. Then you got to come out there, September 8th and 9th, Costa Mesa, California, bedrosecoolian.com forward slash live. Well, I think uh, from this particular episode about self-mastery, I think that's the best way to leave it out. Is there anything else that uh, you want to impart your wisdom today? I think we nailed it, man. I appreciate this opportunity again. You got it. Yes, and uh, give me one more time the website. BedroseCoolian.com forward slash live. All right, friends. I know you got a ton of value from this episode. If you did, give this a like. That would mean a lot for us. And uh, as always, we'll see you in the next episode, my friends. Thank you.